My friends, what's going on? Welcome to this episode of Diner Talks with James. I'm James. <laughs> Super excited to have you all here, friends. This is the first episode that I'm recording in 2021. Yay! We are off to the races, y'all. And my first guest of 2021, I am pumped about. Dr. Jennifer Mullen. A name, if you don't know, you about to know, Okay. She and I became friends a while ago when we worked at New Jersey City University, and I told her to leave her job then, and she just left it a few months ago, and I am excited to have her here because, A, she's a good friend of mine. Uh, she's a fellow speaker, but she is so much more than that. She is the founder of Decolonizing Therapy, which you are, you are not following Decolonizing Therapy on Instagram. You need to. She is helping individuals get back to their roots through uh, ancestral roots and through therapy and through speeches and through workshops and through podcasts and through all of these things. She is helping individuals recognize that maybe it's not me. Maybe it's my past. Maybe this is systemic, what I'm going through. Maybe there are something bigger at play, and I need to stop beating myself up and start recognizing that there's a bigger picture at play. She's also someone who talks more about astrology than anyone with tarot cards, and so I'm excited to have a conversation with her, y'all. Make sure you check her out uh, at her website at Decolonizing Therapy on Instagram, and she is a wonderful human being. Let's slow clap it out right now for the one the only Dr. Jennifer Mullen. What is going on? James, that was a great intro. Look Thanks. at you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All those years of improv. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. Oh, friend, how are you? I am well as possible. I am self-employed, so that's always a good day, right? <laughs> and newly self-employed. Newly self-employed. I'm a baby. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just literally a couple of weeks. Literally. Splashing around in the kiddie pool of entrepreneurship. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I no love doubt. it. Congratulations. No what a huge move. Um, I'm so excited to be with you. Now, it's interesting. I, I mean... You know, I know you as Jen um, or Jennifer. Is it okay? Can I call you that? It's Dr. Mullen for sure. But, you know, I knew you from back in the day. And so, you know, you let me know what you need me to call you because I want to I want to pay respect to the work that you've done. You better call me Jen or Jennifer <laughs> or Jenny. <laughs> you start calling me doctor, it's going to get really uncomfortable. <laughs> All right. Good. You're my boy. You're my I like, boy. I like to ask up top, you know, no disrespect out here. I respect that. Um, I respect that. <laughs> So you and I have known each other since I believe 20, uh, 2011 ish, um, is when I started working at New Jersey city university, um, a, an institution that you and I both know and love, um, you know, and love it more than I do. Cause you spent more time there, but, uh, um, and we connected very quickly. Once we found out our birthdays were a day apart, correct? One day. One One day. day I'm the apart. 18th of july and you were the 19th yeah the 19th, yep 19th yep exactly and i was supposed to be born on the 18th 4 a.m happened though on the 19th and that's when your boy showed up <laughs> and a night owl ever since <laughs> uh i love it but we connected super quickly uh just because I mean, even in the land of, uh, of education, you still got people that love to wear masks and love to be fake. Um, mm -hmm. You weren't about the bullshit. And I think you could tell that I wasn't either. And uh, it was a breath of fresh air meeting you. And I just, I don't know, you have, you've helped me so much. I'll start out cheesy. I don't, I don't really care. Um, uh, I love cheese. It's, it's one of the things that keeps me so sexy eating all this cheese. Um, uh, <laughs> shout but, out to uh, dairy. Shout out to dairy. We out here. Um, but, uh, you have helped me immensely. Um, just through, uh, through our time working together and whatnot. And as I tried to grow my courage to go out on my own as a speaker and, and, and whatnot. And, uh, but then, you know, I went through a, a, a divorce and, and you were there, uh, and I cannot thank you enough in that moment, uh, for the way that you showed up for me, for the way that you taught me that, uh, you know, maybe these tears weren't guilt and shame. Maybe they were mourning a life that I have been grown out of and moved on to something else beautiful. And I'm just mourning, uh, what had been in, what is now going to be in the past. Um, and, uh, that was a really beautiful mental shift, uh, that, that I needed in that moment. 
Um, and so there aren't many people that I've openly wept in front of, Jen, but you are one. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> you see why we're friends? <laughs> That's it. That's it. No, no. And, and I just gotta. I just have to say, um, it, you make it easy, James. You know, you make it easy. You know, from from the get when I saw you across the room with the plaid jacket and the glasses and the hat, I was like, uh -huh. who is this character? I need to know him. And, and then to find out our birthdays were a day apart, as you said. Forget it. My astrological heart was just like, oh, this is amazing. And um, but as a, as a human, I just want to say, and I'm not saying this because you just did this beautiful montage. I'm serious. I'm dead up serious. Um, you're just like one of my favorite people. You know, any any opportunity or when you were in town or in New York or you know whatever it is, whenever we were crossing paths, that we would always try to get up and and hang. And so it's just been a pleasure um, watching you live at Improv North. Oh my gosh, North, North Coast, Coast. Yeah. North Coast. Um, meeting your friends from LA. I don't know. I just feel like we always kind of flowed when needed to be, and it just always felt easy in a good way. You know, yeah. easy having a, this this friendship. Thank you for being a friend. Easy is the <laughs> perfect word, uh, for sure, for sure. Um, and that's why I thought you'd be an amazing guest here at Diner Talks, right? We're hanging out in a diner right now. I mean, we're not really because COVID, but anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> eventually we'll figure out a way to do this. That, that is the goal of the podcast, is to have, actually do it shooting it live in a diner um, with a few mm -hmm. cameras. I think that'd be dope. But uh, also, I just want to eat pancakes more often, so any excuse. <clears throat> but uh, I'm curious, since this is Diner Talks, Jen, let's start off with a very mm -hmm. important question. What's your late night guilty move? Right? Mm -hmm. you, and let's say pre-COVID. Of it also like if you had the opportunity to go out and grab something are you a diner person are you a late night move uh do you do, you do that what's what's you're, you feel a little nocturnal to me i'm um, very nocturnal yes. very very <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly what's your, what's your move late at night late at night ideally i um well we're talking pre-COVID, yeah? Pre-COVID, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. pre-COVID, definitely, like, meeting up with friends, diner, someone might say, uh, oh, there's this, you know, dope spoken word slash astrology slash art <laughs> slash uh, everybody can paint on a person with a canvas slash whatever. Mm -hmm. it, you know, there would be some sort of, like, bonkers artistic thing and it would just get my goat so that's one thing um or friends just saying hey yo i'm outside your house let's just go for a ride and chill and go by the piers like we were young except not do anything illegal yep, yep. i'm your person um or you know literally on a couch with a book or in my bed with a book and my my cat on my my chest um or lately really indulging in a really juicy netflix show or something helping me feel more connected to people yeah. <laughs> and the world yeah 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 do you have a guilty pleasure that you're watching lately something you don't want to say or share out loud but are you about to anyway <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> I really do feel guilty about this. I'm not even going to front. Wait. I can't wait. Oh, man. <laughs> I should have been like, I don't want to talk about this show. No. It's, it's, and maybe. It's, uh, I gave you the opportunity to say that you don't want to talk about things. So. It's Bridgerton, okay? It's Bridgerton. Bridgerton. Very, yes. let's, let's, let's shout out Bridgerton's diverse cast, though. Can we? Yes. Just a yes. Bit? Um, right? Yes. They, they did it right. Um. Yes. <laughs> and it is Shonda, and I, and I wanted to support, mm -hmm. and. It reeled me in. My roommate was like, let's watch it. I'm like, oh, I don't do these kind of timepiece things. And she's like, no, no, no. It's it's very 2020, 2021. I was like, I don't know what that means, but let's go with it. And then I got sucked in. I found, you know, during the day, I found myself thinking about the characters. I was analyzing their motives. And I'm like, oh, I'm hooked. I'm hooked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And no you know, wait, I don't mean to cut you off, but it was, the thing is, is that I don't like watching the thing that everybody is watching, not everybody, yes. but that it's really big. And I'm yes. like, I'll wait a year, two years down the road and I'll see what I think about it. But I got hooked. I, yep. got hooked. I very yeah. proudly never watched Tiger King. Um, and I also very proudly have never seen Titanic. So take that what? world. Take that what? world. <laughs> <laughs> I showed you. <laughs> I've never watched Tiger, Tiger King either. I saw one episode and I felt nauseous and yeah. I was like, okay, what is your guilty? Do you mind me asking? Like, what is your guilty? Do you, 
watch Netflix for a while you weren't watching TV or you didn't have a TV. Or something. Yeah, for a while I, did, I didn't have a TV. When I moved to yeah. New York, when I moved to New York, I initially said, you know what? I don't want to buy a TV because I don't need an excuse to not experience the greatest city on earth. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I intentionally didn't buy a TV. Um, but uh, I've since I've since migrated back to the television. The soft glow calls us all at times. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm I'm not I'm. We are, uh, I am 20 seasons deep into Beat Bobby Flay. Um, oh. And uh, so we're at Food Network. And then, I mean, I uh, I don't know, uh, definitely I'm a, I'm a British baking show fan. Um, great British Me baking too. show. Yep. So finished them all. Those. Yep. Finished them all. Watching the holiday ones now, which are trash, but I'm still watching them just to feel some sense of connection. Same here. Um, yeah. That's a good bake. That's a yeah. good bake. No soggy mm. bottom. No soggy bottom. Come on now. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> the only time in my life is that I don't want a soggy bottom. Um, but uh, the uh, <laughs> uh, that's actually my drag name, Soggy Bottom. Um, <laughs> That would really be great. <laughs> that definitely, because of British Baking Show, there is definitely a queen out there named Soggy Bottom right now. You know that's happening. Without a doubt. Without um, yeah. a doubt. <laughs> so, yeah. And Mary Berry or something. Mary, Mary, Mary Berry. Berry, yep. <laughs> yep. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And the other show that I just finished watching that I absolutely loved, um, I would not say it's a guilty thing, uh, but I watched The Good Place and I just hadn't yes. watched it. Um, but it was it was incredible. Darcy Carden is, is a friend of mine. And, uh, and so I, I was a good, finally a good friend and got to uh, support her. And uh, so, yeah, it was really, uh, I mean, just, I don't know. I just love the mash of the mashup of ethics and comedy. That's kind of where I like to live. So. Mm, beautiful. No, that's, that's deep, James. That's deep, man. No, I love that. You know what my, um, I don't know. It has my heart right now. And I, I've been telling everybody about it. And it was like a, a surprise. I felt like I fell in love with like a cast and I, and I swear that, this other aspect of me is David Rose is Shit's Creek. Yes. I, I'm late to the game. I was late to the game. Yep. Right. And I had like some minor like uh, leg surgery thing. So I was like, had to be on my behind for like a couple of days and I just indulged and it got better and better and better. And the characters came to life and the yeah. Moira's cockawing. And I'm just like, Eugene Levy, like how how much better does it get? Like Catherine O'Hara, you know. So um, for me, Schitt's Creek is just my sort of like the office was for me like maybe ten years ago. Yeah, you know. Yep, I'm on a season one, episode five of Schitt's Creek. So we're 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 doing it. I'm I'm drinking the Kool Aid. Drink it, and, I, and I hate the mayor. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, rolling shit. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> They say, you know, so funny. Uh, so here's the other fun thing about you is that, you know, you mentioned earlier that we are uh, a fellow, fellow Cancerians. Um, and now astrology is something that is huge for you, at least uh, seemingly outward facing, I assume inwardly as well. Um, and uh, so we are both cancers. Um, mm-hmm. When did astrology, like when does that, when is that something that became a, a source of, I don't know, guidance for you, or mm-hmm. I don't even know how you would describe it, right? A source of guidance, mm-hmm. a source of light, a source mm-hmm. of, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because there's two things that my family did that were probably a bit odd yet. It just seemed like the norm to me. And one is, um, give each other appropriate <laughs> massages when our body hurt. Like literally like every single one of us, random, random fact. I know this is what the Mullins did. Um, but the other thing is read astrology, like each other's, um, you know, like cheesy. I don't know if it was like next to Dear Abby or something like that. Yeah, and Daily News. Yeah, Star mm-hmm. Ledger. Like my father just like, oh, look, look, cancer. And then me and my brother would come running and my brother is a Taurus. My dad's a Sag. My mom's Pisces. Little did I know that was only like the tip of the iceberg. Like I didn't, yeah. it wasn't really understanding. Um and then, so that was then, you know, it was just sort of a thing. I don't think that they believed in it, but mm-hmm. it was a thing. And then growing up around my grandparents in Brooklyn, <clears throat> what was interesting is that my grandmother would always like, oh, oh, Walter Mercado, Walter Mercado's on TV, you know, and, and Walter <laughs> Mercado, and, and if y'all don't know, um, if you are Latinx in any way, um, if that, that is any of your background, you probably know who Walter Mercado, Mercado was or is. Um, 
he has passed on, but there is a Netflix show about Walter's life that is bomb. So please check it out. Um, but it was this sort of like cross-dressing, fabulous, um, androgynous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, meticulous <laughs> being just with a cape, you know, like very Liberace energy turning around and just cancer, mira, you know, and then we would all just like, oh, oh, that's about this one and that one and this one. So it was that. This guy sounds like then, a spirit animal. Right? <laughs> I mean, seriously, dude, you need to watch it. And it's so, probably an inappropriate thing to say, but stick with me. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, we can come back to that later. I'm sorry. Yep, yep, just a little bit. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> It only took me what? It only took me uh, 15 minutes to say something wrong. That's not bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not bad. Not bad. I'm proving. <laughs> but um, yeah, and, and then honestly, um, a str I wanted. I was seriously going to be an astronomer, like yeah. seriously. Um, you know, psychology got me because hey, my shit ton of issues and <laughs> mixed in with being a caretaker and a cancer sun sign. Yeah, yeah. Come on. It's a recipe for like counselor, therapist, <laughs> what, what? <laughs> but um, honestly, truly, uh, I, I was in love with like constellations and other galaxies. And then, yeah. so I think astrology felt like a safe enough, close enough connection um, to it all. And then I had like, then I moved to California and then I had like mm. 18,000 friends around me that were like, uh, do you want to come over for dinner? You know, da, da, da. I'm like, sure, sure. Um, what's your sun, your rising and your moon? Because I want to make sure that it's a good group, that there's no drama and I don't want to have too much fire. Wow. And I'm just like, wow, seriously, <laughs> like dead up, dead up. And I'd be like, so here I, am, here I am Googling. Well, I didn't have a phone like that. We didn't have like the handheld computer, but I'm like, sun sign, moon sign. What the fuck? <laughs> what time was I born? You're like calling your parents. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Like, Ma, she's like, I don't know. I was in pain. It was a C section. I'm like, come on. What is this? <laughs> So yeah, that's that's yeah. a little bit. I mean, I'm simplifying, and and then even now, one of my best friends, um, shout out to Dawn. You can find her at Wall Witch Astrology on Instagram. Right. Shameless plug. Yep. Um, uh, Dawn Harrison is a brilliant, uh, unique so a civil engineer and an astrologer. So talk about two sides of the brain. Yeah. And so like for Christmas and my birthday, she's like, hey, so you want a reading? You want to spread? I'm like, yes, I do. Yes, I do. So I learned through her understanding how this is sort of a snapshot of the sky and the constellations and the planets when you were born. And as a Cancer, I'm just like, oh, this is, this is a reflection of me. And then the more that I unpacked it, um, and the more I got became spiritual or, or walked into my spirituality, the more I saw how much it resonated. Yeah. 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 That's incredible. I feel like, and I don't know, I mean, social media obviously brings so many things to light and maybe it's just a crew that I'm now running with that I didn't know this about them in the past, but I feel like astrology and crystals and like, you know, I feel, I feel like the rock industry, like, I don't know, I should have invested in that a while ago. I feel like it's that market skyrocketed, right? I could have rode that all the way up. Um, but like, I'm just, I think it's, it's been, what, a what, what do you think this, it's, I don't even know if this, I, I can't call it a resurgence. Is there a surgence, a word? Uh, like, what is the rise of it? Like, what, how are you, are you noticing that? Or has it always been there? And I'm just around more people who are into it. Um, I think it's both and, honestly. I think okay. I truly, I, I don't know if that's even possible, but um, I think a number of us were in the closet with it, you know, because it wasn't the thing to talk about or do. People would be like, oh, that's really woo woo, or oh, that's cute, but that's not a real science. Same thing they say kind of about psychology, or, um, you know, it's all made up or it's all for fun. And it can be, it can be. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that there's a number of us that, you know, we're always had like our, you know, quartz in the back pocket or, you know, always wearing my black tourmaline. I'm like, always have black tourmaline on me uh -huh. <laughs> to repel. And, you know, um, these are things that sort of, not only did I grow up with, like my mom didn't teach me this, but I grew up with in the sense that I remember going to Christopher Street at like 19 years old, 20 years old and hanging out and, um, this place called Stick Stones and Bones. I don't think it's there anymore. It's like two blocks off of the path on Christopher. 
And uh, me and my friends would just be drawn there. And like, ooh, sage. And oh, this. And ooh, you know, um, uh, this tourmaline. Look, look, I even have my there you go. A little rose quartz right there for self-love, yeah. y'all. You look beautiful. Right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think that there's some of us that, you know, felt this pull. Yeah. And and I think what's happening is that the world feels so intense and heavy and just purely, for some, not all, a bit hopeless. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it sort of feels like this, like, bad dream that just won't ever end. You know, you keep waking yourself up and it's like... Yeah. Still here, fam. Um, and, and I do believe that it is like a source of unity and it's a source of connection and like re-remembering mm. some of what Mother Earth is naturally giving us rather than needing to buy everything. But don't get me wrong, the industry can be a total materialistic crackpot, right? Like, <laughs> right? Like it's, it could be totally messed up as well. Yeah. It's, it's so, I mean, you know, you talked earlier about, uh, how you would sit around the daily no news and read horoscopes, right? That's what I mean. I knew, I knew I was a cancer for a while. And basically I knew that what that meant is that I cry a lot. And I was like, that sounds about right. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I was like, well, I can't, I can't fault that. Maybe this is pretty accurate, but you know, <laughs> when your introduction to astrology is newspaper horoscopes, you're kind of like, what are we doing here, right? It's it feels like the same dude that writes the fortune cookies is the same dude writing the horoscopes, right? And it's just kind of, um, and and that's just, that's how it felt, right? That same person, um, because they're they're pretty flippant, very open minded, right? Or not open minded, open open ended, and just like too broad, where it's like, breathe in oxygen today because you're an Aquarius and you need it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, all right. That's true. But I really, I do need to do that. That's true. Um, right. And, uh, but there's so many of these cool levels, right? I just have my chart read. Um, and, uh, and you know, when it comes to ice cream, I'm a firm believer that three scoops are better than one. And it turns out when it comes to my star chart, I'm the same way. Cause I'm a triple cancer. Um, and, uh, and so it is, uh, but yeah, I mean, it is fascinating. And now I'm someone who, uh, you know, especially coming up through the education world, you know, in the counseling world and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, leadership world, you know, I do the Myers Briggs, I do the Strengths Quest, yeah. the Enneagram, True Colors, Enneagram, yeah, yeah, Enneagram, Enneagram, however you say Enneagram, it, right? Enneagram. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and um, and so like I know all my things, right? And so it's it's so funny because. Sometimes you wonder if astrology is just another one of those things where it's like, all right, how can we put people in boxes, mm, right? Mm. Um, and because uh, sometimes Myers Briggs feels that way, um, yeah. and sometimes like you know, it's just kind of like, all right, cool. Now we have another way to label somebody. Phew, good thing we created that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, and so that's kind of where astrology sometimes sat for me where it's like, mm -hmm. I just, do I need another label? What does this mean? And, but it's been interesting learning more, right. And, and spending time with individuals that can go deeper than the last page in the newspaper next to the weather map. Um, uh, right. And so, facts, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's been, it is, it is, it's been very fascinating to learn more about it for sure. Um, and, and I'm fascinated yeah. with the sky. Like I'm always on the hunt for a dark sky. Now, mm -hmm. whenever I travel, I'm always, you know, trying to push myself into, you know, deeper into the woods or deeper into wherever, mm -hmm. um, just to be able to see the sky and capture it, you know, whether it's with my camera or just my eyes. Um, and so I, I don't know, I've always been fascinated with, with the more, um, and astrology kind of taps you into that. So it is fascinating. It does. It does. And, and it, it kind of, um, I, I really do feel like it's like an onion. It's just like, there's all these layers. Mm. Um, now I'm at this phase where I'm understanding, oh, what are some of the aspects about me and, and my chart that don't have any planets in them? And what does that mean when you have empty houses? And again, like any good relationship, it just keeps on getting interesting and I'm learning more about myself and my chart yeah. and how that shows up for me, even past lives, if that's your thing. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, your North Node and your South Node can tell you so much about, you know, what kind of things you did in the past and what you need to focus on when you're here. And um, I don't know, it always feels good when it resonates the path I'm on. So I guess I'm kind of selfish that way <laughs> 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 because it's just sort of like, yeah, wait a minute, this is, I've been working on boundaries my whole life. This makes perfect effing sense. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's sort of like you, I, I personally feel seen in yeah. ways that um, I don't think other people, you know, get, can always 
see these other layers of you. Um, so yeah, for the record, I'm, I'm a Cancer Sun and I always held strongly to that, but my other two main planets are Earth. So I think that's interesting. Um, Virgo is my rising and my moon is Capricorn. Okay. Um, so it makes sense, like the goat, <laughs> like on those little mountains, yep. just like plugging along and I, I might take longer than the average person, but, mm -hmm. but I'll get there. I'll get, we'll get there. there. I yeah. just, uh, uh, my my wife and I just gave birth. Well, I guess technically she did, right? That's how science works. Um, to uh, <laughs> to our to to a baby boy on uh, on 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 New Year's Eve. Um, so full full on Capricorn coming through. Uh, born the goat. I like born it. the goat. I love it. I love it. You need to get a grill when he's like five. That's happening. G O A T. Yeah. No, that's definitely happening. Uh. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna stay crispy in these streets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so here's the here's what's cool is that in the work that you do, right? Whether it's in your in your workshops or in your groups that you run mm -hmm. uh, and whatnot, you you combine this spirituality side um, with some of the more, I still call it a hard science. You're right. People don't oftentimes, but like psychology, right? They're definitely, there's, there's some hard, it's harder science than astrology. Don't let mm -hmm. theology fool you. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> and so, um, but how do you find the balance? Uh, how have you found the balance in your work between juggling those two? Have you ever felt pushback or it's like, no, I found my people and, and my people like both. And so that's why it works. But I guess, you know, is I could see that being a place where you potentially catch a little, a little bit of heat of like, how can you over here wield the, you know, the doctorate, the, the side D yet you're over here talking about, uh, you know, your rose quartz. Um, right? <laughs> <laughs> so how, I mean, how has that balance been for you and how do you see them combining? Cause obviously you've built a career on the combination of them. Mm. Thank you. You know, I mean, I'm like, thank you. I think it's a compliment. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, truly, um, Again, I think I, maybe I'm a narcissist and I don't even know it. That was, <laughs> joke, not joke. Yeah, truly, some of it has been, you, you know, about finding, hey, is there anyone out there that also feels this way? And, you know, truly starting this work, it wasn't with the vision to get everybody on the same page with what I'm about, you know, what I'm doing. It was more like, hey, here's my little slice of the world. And I think that a lot more... Um, related to, and spirituality is such a, a large umbrella term, right? But, yeah. but, but, you know, and even myself, I don't know what else to call it. it it's just this otherness, this otherworldliness, like, hey, this is a really big part of not just my life, but a lot of the people that I work with and serve, yeah? yeah. And hey, this psychology thing is super important, right? Because people are out here dying and, you know, feeling unworthy and we're needing to help people live their best lives and stabilize themselves and keep communities safe. So it sort of has been like a gradual unraveling um, of my own personal life as well as the work that I do. And I have to be honest, you know, shout out to every single student at new, well, most students, <laughs> shady, um, at New Jersey City University. Um, because I, I honestly think that the students have been like my best teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is a funny little story, but I think that you'll appreciate this. This is probably over the last year or so, and then I'm really gonna answer your question, I promise. Okay. But so the student <laughs> comes in and she's like, so 19 years old, right? She's like, so. Um, I have a really important question and I need you to answer it directly. And, and I'm like, all serious. I'm like, okay, so we're not playing around. I'm like, what's it gonna be? And I said, yeah, I welcome these kind of questions. What's up? What's your astrological sign? Because I can't fuck with a Pisces. I was just like, I'm dead. I am dead. 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 And but honestly, you know, no one else is around. You can't look at anyone and be like, this is great. This is great. You know, I just was like, and, and to this day, actually, no freaking lie. She is the one that gave me this moon sign tapestry. Oh, when she yeah. moved on. No lie. No lie. Yeah. Shout out to you. You know who you are. Um, <laughs> But um, truthfully, it really came into contact also with the work on 
myself and my ancestors. You know, um, my dissertation was all around intergenerational trauma, which is essentially, you know, when um, trauma from our history, it could be yeah. from the land, from our um, culture, from our people, whatever, whoever, whomever your people are, when that gets passed down either epigenetically, intrapsychically, um, through role modeling, through our environment, and it can change our DNA expression, right? And so mm -hmm. epigenetics has been around for a hell of a long time, but it's getting its kind of like astrology and crystals. It's sort of getting its day again, right? Yeah. And people are paying attention. Um, and so in that process and along in my own spiritual process, you know, I, I train, I'm, I, I'm a shaman as well. You know, I'm trained as a shaman and, and that started not like, oh, I think I'm going to be a shaman, you know, and I think it's, <laughs> you I, think it's you know, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to shamanize shit. <laughs> Come on over here. Great. <laughs> Isle <aisle> 23. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was sort of like, okay you know gently stepping into things checking it out mm -hmm. having a reading with a person and then little by little opening and then realizing i can do this and you know, and then realizing the roots of psychology james and that's where it just my brain my heart my spirit was like oh shit, yeah. this is why y'all put me here this is why i'm doing what i'm doing that me y'all meaning my ancestors, my spirit team, you know, the people that have my back. And I always say, like, I work for them. I work for God. I work for spirit now. You yeah, know, so yeah. I'm always be fucking employed, right? Because <laughs> because they got my back, it, truly. And I feel this way. So um, it's been fascinating to look at the roots of mental health and psychiatry mm -hmm. to see that it's always been led by religious leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, they were, they were making, I think, a recent post I put out there, like small holes in someone's head, not enough to kill them, right? And it is rather barbaric, <laughs> but to release the bad spirit, the negative spirit, the dark spirit. Um, looking at a lot of our indigenous and native tribes, our African tribes, right? What were they doing? There was always a shaman when someone came back from war. And they stayed with them for three to six months to a year, make sure they were safe, make sure they were eating. Oftentimes people, and they weren't calling it trauma, were coming back from war, traumatized, not able to speak, not able to remember people's names. And then the shaman and other members of the community would hold energetically and spiritually and emotionally that person until they came back into their body and became themselves until they were whole. And um, that gives me goosebumps. You know, that's, that's like a concerto for me. That's just like, for me, it's like reminding me that some psych like psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers are the original healers. And yet um, last thing I want to say for pass it on to you is that, you know, in our schools, we weren't learning this. So we weren't learning any of it. We were learning, we weren't talking about healing. We were talking about treating. And although mm. there are places for treatment, I believe that the medical model leaves a lot to be, you know, what's the word I want to use? There, there's just a lot that it's missing. Yeah. yeah, and not everything can be treated away with pills or putting somebody away. And sometimes we need to because they don't have community, they don't have neighbors, they don't have loved ones to hold them and, and watch them and take care of them. And, we're scared of mental health, right? We're at the at our core. We're scared of people um, when they don't seem sane, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. You know, when they're not well, yeah, we're yeah. scared. Yeah, well, yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. you just something powerful. I, I want. I begin to hear your definition of it, or definition maybe too strong of a word, but like, what is in your eyes the difference between treatment and healing? Right? Because mm. I think a lot of people do hold those in the same hand of mm -hmm. like, well, treatment is they're the one and the same, right? One begets the other. Um, and so how do you like, what is, what's the difference in your eyes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, treatment is a lot more clinical. It's um, supported by the medical model and the medical field. Mm -hmm. And although there's some beautiful things, I just want to say that with the medical model um, and the medical field, it's can be super pathologizing. Uh, we were talking about boxes before. James, right? Like, and we were talking about like astrology or the Myers Briggs or what have you. In many ways, it's the same thing. Well, here's a cluster of symptoms. So you are schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. You are, but you know, you have bipolar disorder. You or this, the DSM, you that. the DSM five. Here we are. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. You yeah. know, and these clusters of symptoms state that you are this, and so that can be relieving. 
for many, many people. Cause it's like, oh snap, I'm not alone. You yeah. know, bunch of other people experience internal dialogue, da -da 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 -da, delusions of grandeur, da -da 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 -da. and after some time, it can also start to make people feel as though, well, this is why I can't have relationship because I'm borderline, or this is why I can't do this because blah, 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 you know? And I feel that it doesn't take into account healing. Um, and healing um, for many of us and many people also involves family, Mm -hmm. or soul, <laughs> our souls, you know, healing for some people can also involve herbs and plants and tinctures. Um, mm -hmm. Healing can involve tower decks for some people. Um, healing can involve um, ritual of any kind that is necessary. Um, you know, you think of acupuncture, there's ritual there, right? If anyone's mm -hmm. ever gotten moxie and, you know, they have this glass on top of it's pretty, you know, it's pretty cool. It's pretty out there if you really think about it. But now we're starting to see it as a form of healing yeah. treatment, right? But there's still some medical professionals out there that are like, acupuncture, that ain't shit. You know, actually, <laughs> don't do shit. And meanwhile, some of us that swear by it are like, uh, acupuncture is life. Okay. If you have I just pain. got in, I just got in uh, literally a year, uh, a year, year and a half ago, I just started doing acupuncture and I was like, this half of the world that uses this and some of the oldest people in the world, <laughs> right. That, you know, and I was like, clearly this thing works, right. It's not like there's a drastically different rate of dying or whatever. Um, and so there's, there's, I'm, I'm fascinated just like the science the science nerd in me was like, all right, let's get some of these needles in me. Let's figure this out. Um, <laughs> it's been fascinating and healing. Um, I, I do recommend it to others for sure. Likewise. Yeah. 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 So, so I, I do think that healing also allows the person giving you support to be a lot more present. Um, so are there therapists out there that are healing? Hell yeah. You know, are there therapists out there that can treat you? Sure, but I think it also places this false belief that, you know, we're doing something or giving you something that you don't already have. And I think that that's erroneous on all counts. Um, really, my job as a psychologist, a therapist, a healer, whatever I am on any given day, is to help a person be more of themselves by being a reflection, by being a mirror. And the way that I do that is by holding a container to mm. allow someone to have the safety enough to talk about shit they don't want to talk to other people about yeah. that is eroding their energy and spirit. Um, but I have to be real that nine times out of 10, when we when things start to get real in the therapeutic room or in group work, it is the healing stuff, like screaming at the top of your lungs. People would think, okay, we don't do that in therapy. But how else do we sometimes just get shit out. You know, you're not hurting anyone. You're not slamming stuff against walls or what have you. You're just, or maybe you are, but safely, but you know, you're just, you know, you're just getting out this rage, understandably so for lots of reasons you might be enraged and no one is trying to lock you up. No one is trying to shoot you. No one is trying to place you in an asylum, but modern psychology would say, oh, we don't want to do that. That's, that's a little too much. So healing, I think is whatever a person needs. Um, to step fully into the center of their being. What do you think about that, James? First of all, that's stunning. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it, it is. I mean, it, I love the difference of it because I think as someone who is, um, yes, I have a, a master's in counseling. I do. I am a coach mm -hmm. as well. Um, but uh, it's one of those things where I'm very good at, at passing out the drugs that I don't always take for myself. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I love that idea of, you know, the counselor that, that, that I now see um, sometimes there is that need for like, all right, what are we working on? How we, you know, let's, you know, let's fix this. Right. Like I have a low self-esteem about my appearance and I can't get out of my own way with any sort of weight loss plan. So like, fix that. Right. But even though I know that's not how it works, but there's this wanting of that, uh, I don't know, that instant, that instant gratification, mm -hmm. um, right. That the world so thrives on right now. Um, and not thrives, survives. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah. um, uh, yeah, I think that, I mean, what you were just talking about as far as creating a container is by far the piece of you that has blown me the, away the most, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I feel like I am, uh, 
in, in watching the work that you did, especially with your, the students at NJCU, right? I mean, you, you helped uh, bring rise to this incredible organization called Peers Educating Peers, the Peppers, um, right? And uh, and this this amazing group of individuals who came in uh, – rage filled uh with all sorts of trauma all sorts of history right i mean those students at njcu most of them have, have, have seen some stuff and been yeah. through some things mm -hmm. um and uh as as a privileged white boy uh who was raised for all intents and purposes with with more than enough and and plenty of privilege every time i took a piss it came out um <laughs> right and uh and, and so uh, to be in that space and to just sit in the room and watch you work and watch you literally construct a container for those individuals to feel, mm. to cry. I mean, there were times where I was sitting in the room and I was crying. I was like, I don't even know I'm crying right now. It doesn't <laughs> pertain to me. Um, <laughs> right? but like, but like uh, that is some of the most beautiful work that I've ever witnessed someone do um, and gotten to see um, and also witness the impact after that too. Cause I work with those students also. Mm. And so I guess that was that was a question that I have for you is, you know, when it came from when it came to a decolonizing therapy um, and, and that idea of wanting to do trauma work, mm -hmm. um, was was it a chicken or the was it the chicken or the egg for you with your students? Did your students mm -hmm. and the work that you do with your students be like, there's something so much more here. I want to dive deeper into this, you know, and then you, you know, when your dissertation and the work that you did there or was it. I want to work at a place like NJCU because I know that, you know, those are my people. I know what I've been through. I know what they've been through. And therefore that's going to be a cool place for me to actually do some of this work while getting a paycheck. Right. Mm. And then <laughs> these other things can happen later. Maybe like, what was it for you? Did those students teach you um, a little bit more about this? They are um, without a doubt, my greatest teachers without a doubt. Um, Every day, I, I'm like thankful for all of them, like hundreds of them. <laughs> I met for many of them throughout the years, and um, working with the students and Pep, working with like with their most of them, a lot of them are like my family now, because yeah. um, we decolonize the fuck out of that too, right? Like you don't can't tell me that you've been such a, a a big piece of my healing, and I've been a big piece of your healing, and now I'm just supposed to say like peace out, bye, you know, after we've spent retreats together and yeah. uh, held you while your mother passed, and you know went with you to the police station to report a murder, and I <laughs> like helped you get out of a gang initiation, like shit. We're fucking family. Like this isn't this isn't um yeah. So honestly, I got back into NJCU just like as a fresh little chicken out of school, and I was just coming back from California and back into the Jersey area, and um I was a little depressed to be real to be real with you. You know, I was a little depressed because Cali transformed me. The Bay Area Californians would rip me alive. They're like, you know, you're not from California when you call it Cali, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so the Bay Area, the Bay, the Yay, uh, transformed me where I, where I really learned how to be instead of just do and mm -hmm. um, try to compete and become. And um, I was coming back and I was depressed as all F. And um, my fiance at the time was just like, well, what's wrong? And the me, like, why can't you be happy? We have a new apartment. We have this. And I'm just like sitting at Uno's, like, like in Flushing, Queens, like, ah, ah, like totally, like I, I didn't understand why. And then when I had this opportunity, because my mentor was moving to Canada to be with their partner, um, it popped up and I was like, oh, Pep raised me. You know, Pep raised me as a youngin in these streets. And like, <laughs> like I am alive because of peers educating peers out of New Jersey City University. Truly, no doubt, like truly alive because of it. And I think a lot of us can say that, that uh, being seen, even with all of our messiness and our shit, um, was one of the most healing things ever, but that healing didn't come from a very traditional therapeutic relationship, you know? And so, yeah, um, decolonizing therapy is without a doubt, not only born from my work with peer educators, but other students in the university, um, as well as even my colleagues, you know, I, I, though a lot of them were amazing. And I'm not just talking about the center, I'm talking about colleagues throughout Jersey and New York, but I also learned what the F not to do <laughs> yeah. through my colleagues, you know, and through sometimes, you know, 
We can both Excuse- name some examples. Ooh, ooh, right? <laughs> Baby. Yes, we can. I just got you. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I just kind of like life suckers, energy sucker, like, like you know, yes. staff or faculty that it's like, yo, like you're around some brilliant people here. You're around some brilliant staff. You're around some brilliant faculty. You're around some brilliant students. And I don't just mean brilliant from the brain, intellectual, mm-hmm. from a Eurocentric standpoint. I mean, people with hard knock knowledge, skills, bars, yeah. art, right? I, I'm pre- pre- Emotional sure. intelligence out the wazoo. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Anyhow, um, I listened, you know, and I think you did too, you know, James, and I was thinking of Jeff and so did Jeff and so did many of us, you know, there was a number of us that I think were like, yo, like they're, they're, you know, that these students are amazing. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of schools say that and a lot of people say that, but I felt it with every ember of my body. And I think that I was at that institution for 12 years. I don't think I know um, to serve the students and to learn from the students humbly and to be corrected and to, um, also give back. And so literally one of my peer educators, a bunch of them called me out on a retreat. And um, we, I asked them one of those, we always have like dinner and breakfast questions mm-hmm. um, because one of my big things is that a lot of um, us that grew up in and around the inner city, you know, didn't always have time with family to sit and eat, or we didn't have space in our houses, or we didn't, you know, there wasn't this like family time component that I think is so important to being seen and like, hey, how's your day, James? How you doing? How's that relationship going? Yeah. How's that? Oh, sometimes get called out on shit, you know? And so at retreats and when we went out, I would try to do that with my students. So like phones away, da 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 away, hats off. Let's, they're like, oh my gosh, complain all you want. You want to eat, let's go, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> I'm sorry, my cat is about to make an appearance, I, you know. I can't sorry. wait. Yeah, <laughs> she's she's circling, um, and so the, the short of it, she's just she's like, is it safe? Is it safe? Always at the worst moments too, um, and you know the short of it is that they they called me out. I was asking some question about like stepping into your your light and your power, and not power in this capitalistic way, but power of like what makes you feel most alive, most centered, most most brilliant, most you know, in mm-hmm. tune with yourself and others. And then they were like, well, you need to answer the question too, Jen. And I'm like, uh, don't you know, and, and that's how they would call me in too, right? Because traditional, <laughs> traditional yeah. stuff, we don't do. Yeah. Okay, okay, here's the oh, chat. There we go, but um, yep. but um. <laughs> <laughs> She's just gonna chill on the cut right now. She'll be back, she'll be back. Yeah. Probably with a butt shot mm-hmm. right there. I don't know how many, I don't know how many students I fired because they decided to tell me my lesson back to my face. Like, Listen, this isn't about me, okay? <laughs> no, you're fired, you're out of here. I'm not, no, it's ain't this not what we're doing here. Right? Like, and, no. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because sometimes I'm like, and for you, I'm like, you don't know me. You don't know me. You don't know me. Like, yeah, right, yeah. Your voice gets super high. I'm good. <laughs> you can always tell I'm telling the truth. And my voice gets real high. Um, what? <laughs> yeah. I get irritable. Yeah. I get like, you know what? I'm so over this conversation. And I get up and I start walking. <laughs> just like, this is like, you always turn shit around on me. It's so annoying. Um, <laughs> But yeah, they call me out and they're like, yo, like, you're going to do an Instagram? The world needs you. The world needs this. Like, we can't be selfish anymore. And literally, those were their words. Like, there were like 30 of them looking at me, including some alumni, just like, we've been talking about this. Like, oh, word, y'all been talking about this shit? See what I mean? Like, I'm like, really? You're talking about my life? Really? <laughs> and yeah, they were just like, you know, and, and yeah. shout out to Shanae Cook. Shanae was like, I'm going to be your social media intern if you'll have me. And this is what we're going to do. And I'm just like, because the thought of social media just felt completely bonkers to me. I'm just like, it's not my thing. I'm not a technological internet person. And so they were like, no, but that's where the world is at right now. And there's a pulse there and just start. And if it flows and it grows and you got something, Jen, and if it doesn't, mm-hmm. we're so proud of you and you're proud of yourself. And I still didn't expect it to get to wherever number it's at now and whatever's happening now. But um Really, it was my way to write again. Yeah, you know, decolonizing therapy it was my way to talk about the heart work I was doing with people. You mm-hmm. know, and it was my way to gently and lovingly call our white allies in, not out. I like to call people in and remind them um, that there's work to do. Yeah, 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 
Yeah. I love that. Have you found through the work in decolonizing therapy, you know, it, again, the bonds that you for, formed with those students and the time, the, the sheer time that you had with them was incredible. Um, are you finding that your bucket is, is being filled um, through the work that you are doing now? It's probably being filled a little bit differently, but how, like, how has that, how has that felt? Um, yeah, I'm not even going to front. Yeah, there, it is getting filled. I am so sorry. <laughs> it is getting filled. Um, but it's different. It, yeah. it, it's sort of like I'm being called to task on filling my own mm -hmm. more. In the last few years, it's felt a little lonely. Um, but I have heard people say that, that are forging. And I'm not saying this in some, again, egotistical way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when we're forging a new path, we're, we're, we're in the, you know, those of us that are like yourself, that are at the precipice of this field and this field, you know, and we do this and this, and we're kind of bringing these together. They're, they're you know, at that middle, that middle center, there's not so many folks there. You know, people say they are, but when it comes down to being about it, sometimes they're not. And sometimes, you know, I need to, I'm realizing I need to be alone a little bit more with my thoughts. I'm needing some time to write. I'm needing some time to cry it out and deal with my own ancestral intergenerational trauma, you know? So, um, I have been, and, and the, this, I'm not saying this for sympathy anyway, <laughs> I'm being very real and transparent and role modeling. Mm -hmm. Like lately I've been feeling alone, not lonely. Tons of people that love me, that reach out to me. If anything, I'm the shittiest person at getting back sometimes, you know, it's like, like I, I'm not lonely, but I'm feeling like alone on this island of, and, and I feel like I need to be here right now. Yeah. Um, I don't think it'll be here like forever, but right now it's like Jen and all her emotions. And so, no, I'm not, I'm getting filled in a way that I know the collective is receiving information, healing, what they need. Yes. But I'm not getting that same, you know, on a daily basis, feeling like I have my family at work, if yeah. that makes any sense. Keep it real with you. Yeah, no, yeah. no, I, I appreciate yeah. you keeping it 100 for sure. I think that uh, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, leadership, uh, trailblazing, right? Like those are often solo acts a little bit as far as, I mean, you needed to come into grips with what's going on in your head, right? Because you're balancing. I, I, I say a lot of times that I'm balancing cons consistently, sorry, consistently there's a war going on inside of me between legacy and presence. Mm. Um, right. And, uh, and so like, I'm, I'm trying to create something beautiful, right. That's going to last for a while. I want to make an impact. And that, that may be egotistical of me to say that I want to, to leave a legacy, but I do, I don't want, this is my blip in the universe, right? Like I'm trying to make it bright. And so, uh, and so with that being said, that's critical, but at the same time, it, it sometimes keeps me from being present. Um, and, but when I do take the time to be present is when I feel alone, Right. Yes, uh, yes. And, and so I don't know the hearing you name it has now given me a, kind of some words to name mm -hmm. it too. I don't know, you know, uh, just not just the COVID of it all where I do feel lonely as an extrovert and someone who just yes. misses hugs. Um, <laughs> and so, uh -huh. right? um, but, uh, but yeah, there is this moment of like, uh, well, what am I doing here? Mm. Am I on the right path? Does this matter? There's a fear and some, some of my, that's where my anxiety creeps in. It's like, I can choose one of these three paths knowing full well, they'll probably all get to me. They'll all get me to some cool spot, but there's an anxiety of like, what am I doing? What would matter most right now? And the pressure that I put on myself, that's where I sometimes feel alone because no one else carries that pressure, that burden. Um, and I don't know, that's, that's what, that's what it looks like for me. That may be different for you, but, but still that's, that's how, I tried on the clothes that you just gave me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. No, I love that you're sharing that, James. And I, I guess I have a question. Can I ask you a question? Please. Wait, you know, you talked about these like three paths and I don't know if it was literal or not, but I'm wondering like what aspect of each of those three paths turn you on and turn you up and turn you out? You know, like what, what, what parts of those three paths just feel like they were made for you? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like, uh, I feel like I was made for more. 
than mm. what I'm currently doing. And I have the opportunity, you know, I mean, I speak to hundreds of thousands of people a year on, uh, you know, and, uh, and on college campuses at corporations and, and events and my own, my own events and stuff like that. Um, but like, there's this feeling of, I want, I want to be more. Um, and I don't, it's hard to name the more. Um, and, and that's a little bit of what this is, this diner talks idea is that like, I want to have, I want to bring vulnerability to the forefront and make it cool. Mm. Um, right. And, and I think, I think Brene Brown has done some of that as well. Like she's incredible. Um, but men don't, men aren't doing it. Right. Um, and so, uh, where are the places where we can laugh and cry in the same space and still all feel like we're moving, um, right. And doing the right thing. And, uh, and so that is the big thing for me. Uh, and so that's why I would love for this to eventually be a television show or of some sorts, right. Yeah. Something people can stream and like watch two people have a really dope conversation and feel like they're sitting in the diner booth with them. Um, right. Like that's the goal of like, here's how we can have a deep conversation about life, about happiness, about success, about race, about gender, about equality, about, you know, inequality, whatever. Um, right. Like let's, let's just have a cool conversation about it. Um, and let's laugh while we do it. I don't know. There's this, I have a, uh, whenever I like go see a Broadway show, or whenever I, there's certain shows that I'll do this. There's a couple of podcasts that I'll listen to that will do, that'll give me the same feeling. Um, but I'll watch a Broadway show and yes, I'll be moved by what is happening in front of me, but there's something so much deeper of like, I want to be that. Mm. Like, I want to be somebody who is creating this emotion that is being created in me and others. Yeah right? Yeah, yeah. And how can I create emotions in more people on a daily basis, on a regular, how can I reach more? Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, I think that's, that's a big thing for me, but that's, but it's tough because there's the other side of it is the feeling of like, well, that's selfish. That's egotistical. That's ignoring what you have done. Right. That's saying like, you know, well, you're not grateful for where you're at. And there is right. There needs to be, you have to be grateful for where we are in the mountain. Um, but, uh, but still, um, I don't know. There's, there's that piece of it. And that's, that's kind of something that drives me. Yeah. And like, that makes it, sense. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And it, um, I want to say, if I may, if I may respond, you know, number one, like, I believe truly James, that that is who you are and who you've embodied since I've met you. And I think that's why you were an honorary peer educator. I didn't give you that title. Right? Mm -hmm. That would be totally the antithesis of what Pep is, right? Like they were like, oh, give James the sweatshirt. I was like, oh. <laughs> okay, you don't ask when the sweatshirt is given, you know, the hoodie, the t-shirt, the whatever, the, you know, whatever it is, that means someone is an honorary, you know, you, um, you bring emotion and vulnerability with you where you go, even imbued in the humor, even imbued amongst um, funny jokes and, and, and corniness and crassness and all of it. Like there, there's a deep authenticity. And then you're like, no, 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 but really, but really though, let's really talk about that. Like, you, you know, like there, there'll be this high and it'll let people have this break, yeah. you know, like a little bit of air comes out of the balloon, just a little bit, just a little yeah. bit. And you can be like, that shit's a lot. And then you get back in it. You know, mm. you're drawn to it. Um, and if I may, astrologically, and, and I'm not an astrologer. I'm not an astrologer, y'all. You know, I'm just a fanatic. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, like the disclaimer on the bottom of a lawyer's email. This is not right. legal advice. This is not. <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking, and it's like, like water sign traits are like highly aware, empathic psychic individuals, right? And it doesn't mean that you have to like hear things or see things, but just like you walk into a room and, and I believe that both of us have this quality and you know it's up, you could feel it. Yeah. You could feel it all. You could feel if there's tension. You could feel, okay, who's the safe person here? Who Who's a, who's a face? Who's making eye contact? Who's not? Who's making me feel icky? What's the problem? <laughs> like, yeah. There's so much. And there's a level of intuition and savvy, even when I've seen you do improv, right? Or the times when you're not doing improv, but you're doing improv anyway. Mm -hmm. um, there's this ability to also give the audience what they want. Mm -hmm. You feed people, James, and that is the that is the crux. That is the that is the teat <laughs> of cancers, right? Cancers are the creative mediums, right? And I mean it in like clairvoyant. Like cancers are the creative mediums, and that your sun 
right? Your moon and your rising are all <laughs> cancer, which is this like deep well. It's like not the top of the ocean. You are representative of the bottom of the ocean. And why? I mean, personally, I fucking love that. I mean, I don't chill at the bottom of the ocean, but I'm saying like the metaphor of the bottom of the ocean is like shit that people find scary, right? Because it's dark, because there's creatures that we can't recognize and they look yeah. deformed, but it's because of the pressure, right? Mm -hmm. It's because of the pressure down there and it's dark and they have to learn how to, how to survive. And I, I just truly believe James, that that's part of how you um, engage with people and engage with the world. And, I, and honestly, friend, like I can't wait to see the next level and the next level and the next, whatever that means. And I don't mean level in this, like get yeah, better because you're already amazing, that. you know, but um I just think that you're already on it. You're on the river. You're in the flow, the path of light, the path mm -hmm. of love. And I have no doubt that, you know, one day you're going to be like, oh, we're going to be inviting each other over. Like, so do you want to come to my veranda off the coast of the Amal? <laughs> like, I can't right now, friend. I'm chilling with koalas down in the outback. <laughs> I'll get up with you. I'll get up with you in six months. Um, but... Yeah, I hope that, you know, and I mean it. I mean what I'm saying. I just, that triple cancer, that's that that's a a love and light superpower. Um, and, I, and I just believe that, you know, our biggest thing is just making sure we have those boundaries up, man. <laughs> we know how to say no. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah, when you said that earlier, I was like, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> things I need to, he need, things we need to consistently hear, uh, for sure. And thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're in motion. Right. And, uh, and, and that's what I love about watching what you're doing. And I mean, cause you know, we're out here, right. Our front, our boy Jeff's doing it too. Um, right. It's just, um, yeah. I, and, and thank you for, uh, thank you for that. It's, it's going to happen. I'm not interested in it not happening. Uh, and, uh, and so we just gotta, just gotta keep putting myself uh, in the room where it happened. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, keep shaking hands and kissing babies. <laughs> uh, and, and keep oozing authenticity. It's, it's going to happen. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited for it. Um, uh, but just like, I mean, just like a wide receiver in football, right? You got to run to where the football is. You can't just expect it to come to you. Um, so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta run to it and make the catch. So Facts. try to yeah. keep, keep put myself in the way of opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I love it. So here's, uh, here's what I want to, uh, I know, I know we just have a, a few more, a few more minutes, about 10 more minutes left. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, decolonizing therapy and hit the, hit the, hit the nail on the head, so to speak. Um, so not all of my listeners are, are, are familiar with the idea of decolonization or colonization for that matter. Right. Like, I mean, I, you know, most of us have played the game risk and so we get it, but, uh, but still <laughs> it's a little, just a little different, I think. Um, and so can you tell, uh, just uh, from a base level, what is what does it mean to decolonize? Yeah. Why is that something that you are uh, on a mission uh, to do? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this as succinct. And, and call me out if you're like, okay, you're losing me. Just tell me. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm really working on making things like palatable and understandable. <laughs> just tell me. Just tell me. But, um, you know, colonization uh, has happened all over the world right for, for for many 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 different lands and it's sort of like you know you're there and you're chilling with your family and you're doing whatever you do you know like making coffee growing bananas rice patties and another larger bigger country superpower comes along and says hey we want to help you out hey we want to put an army base down here or hey we want to help you take this supply product and make a demand you know we want to help um and there's lies in that, yeah. And there's a lot of self-servingness and um, there's contracts and treaties and policy that don't always work. And sometimes, you know, that bigger superpower is not so nice when they come along, right? And sometimes they're not asking. Yep. And sometimes they are, and sometimes they're even asking, right? <laughs> and there is this practice of then um, beginning to take over customs, rituals, ways of being, changing religion, um, sometimes harming the people there, you know, I don't know if there's any babies listening, so I'm trying to keep it PG, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> any little kids. Um, but yeah, usually that involves, 
um, this is a heavy word, you know, the rape, not just of people, but of land, traditions, customs, and culture, you know, and then sometimes the kidnapping, right, um, literally and figuratively. And so with that, then the people that have traditionally been in a particular land, um, they can't kind of survive anymore, right? Like surviving now, I'm asking you to pay me for the farm that my family passed down to me, right? And you're giving me cents, like literally like pesos or, or a little bit of money. And so eventually, because everything then becomes industrialized and contracted and commercialized, we can't even live here anymore because either um, our rich minerals are all exhausted and all our resources are gone or big machines are drilling into our land and it's just not inhabitable and safe anymore, right? So usually then we see our families start to break apart. Mm -hmm. um, so if we looked at, let's say, uh, the Philippines or Mexico or Honduras or, you know, we, we could pick uh, Ghana, you know, we can see the ways in which, let's say, one family member or two is like, listen, gonna leave my child here with you, auntie so-and-so. I'm gonna head out to Britain, to the US, to these bigger superpowers that have caused this mm -hmm. <laughs> strife in the, in the first place. And they say the streets are paved with gold, right? They say it's a better place, right, in America. They say that, you know, I'll be able to bring you all over. I'm gonna work hard. If you work hard, you'll be what you want to be. It'll be okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bad relationship. You see, you know, it's a domestic violence relationship actually, on yeah. a right on a worldwide level because not only is it fucked with your your land, your people, your heritage, it fucked with your head, mm. and that's where I come in. Like, what are the ways that we have been emotionally colonized, right? What are the ways that colonization um, has continued to erode and disconnect us from this sense of our root, our home? You know, whatever, and home doesn't have to be a place, you know, but it can be, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And so when you when you think of a lot of black identified people in America, you know, there's there's such a disconnect between like, especially if you don't feel this connection to Africa or like no one ever taught you about, oh, you know, you're Ghanaian or you're this or you're Kenyan or you're from Sierra Leone or what have you, there's this deep disconnect. And then and then there has been this whole, you know, African Holocaust, right? This literally taking people, and of course slavery happened all over the world, right? But not at the magnitude that the transatlantic slave trade was. Um, and a lot of people think that North America is the biggest hotbed for the um, kidnapping and the killing and the selling and the mule work of slaves. And it wasn't actually like Brazil is one of the largest hotspots, you know, mm -hmm. Brazil, um, the Caribbean, and then North America and Central America would be next. Um, and so why I was interested in this is because um, I started seeing that um, no shade, all love. Um, my students would say no tea, all shade. <laughs> no tea, no shade. <laughs> um, you know, that the reality is that, you know, diversity trainings and cultural competence are often the really failed attempt at trying to really elicit change. You know, I was getting really tired, you know, having to attend, you did them, you know, we had to attend them. <laughs> yep. Implicit bias, let's call the shit what it is. You know, white people not wanting to take responsibility for doing shit different and seeing shit different, right? Mm -hmm. Let's call it what it is. Let's not call it um, diversity training. Let's call it the fact that people are not wanting to change with the times and that we're living, amidst a lot of white bodied supremacy. And, and so I also wanna say when I talk about white supremacy or other people talk about white supremacy, you know, we're talking about the fact that even if we got rid of every proud boy and KKK member in the world and rounded them up and put them on this island, we don't wanna kill them, to put them on an island. Sure, yeah. Would racism still exist? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Or would sexism still exist? Would patriarchy still exist? Would, you know, um, would white supremacy exist? Yeah, because it's it's um, in our policies, in the way that we learn, in our education, it's in our medical field, and it's in our mental health field. And that's where I come in. So decolonizing therapy is looking at the ways that, you know, our the history that many people in many countries, including Europe, right, bro, like, right? Including Ireland. Oh, 
move, right? We can we can talk about colonization all day, um, but there has been a lot of harm that has been enacted and that's historical trauma or historical grief, right? And it doesn't mean that people need to sit in it all day and just be like, this is who I am, just my history. But oftentimes when your identity is racialized, yeah. right? When the world treats you the way they see you, right? And if you look anything other than what is seen as mainstream or attractive or beautiful, whatever whatever mainstream is, and that's usually white, right? Mm -hmm. yep. um, then you get racialized, you get treated differently. So you start trying to understand, well, why am I treated like this, right? Or what's different about me? I'm not different. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people go through these stages of like, I'm not a race, even a person of color. Like, I'm not a race, I'm a person, you know? And so we're all on this journey of better understanding and bringing ourselves in my humble opinion, home. And I think that the mental health field has done a lot of harm in, as we talked about before, diagnosing and pathologizing yeah, yeah. Uh, culture bound syndromes, pathologizing rage and anger, which is you know what I specialize in, um, pathologizing trauma. Right. So we, we will see the school to prison pipeline. So when we talk about that, that means that, you know, when you're seeing prison guards, not prison guards, but you're seeing security guards and cops in elementary schools and high schools in predominantly black areas, you know, you're, you're priming them. You know, when third and fourth grade African-American male test scores are being used to decide how many prisons we're going to build in 10 years. Woo, baby. Right. Like That's I get chills every time I say it Yeah, because. Yeah. It's, it's real, you know? And then unfortunately with the brutal, violent murders of um, George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, man, and Tamir Rice, and we can keep going, Sandra Bland and people in our own hoods and communities. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a chunk of the world that might have been previously asleep or choosing not to see things or not needing to address things with such urgency started being like, you know, that's, that's fucked up. <laughs> right. Like well, my kid is mixed race or my, my daughter's boyfriend is black or, or whatever it is. Maybe they were just in the perfect time or, or, Hey, yo, that's a human. What the fuck? Like we don't, yeah. we, you know, and, and, and I think that people of color, particularly black folks, um, whole bodies, like even my body right now is like, woof, I'm feeling it. Um, the level of trauma of witnessing and hearing a, a grown man cry for his mother for eight minutes, and what was it, 43 seconds. Yep, exactly. Every time, I couldn't watch it, I, could, yeah, I can't watch it. But every time I think about that, and I think about how unsafe the people were around the cops that couldn't say, like, or, or, or like, stop it. Like, you know, imagine if a mob of black people tried to stop a cop from choking someone out, forget mm -hmm. it. Like it just, it would be open season. The dogs would be out, you know, or so we believe because that's our history, you know? So um, this is, this is about bringing humanity. Decolonizing therapy is about bringing humanity back to mental health and dismantling the mental health system the way it is now, mm -hmm. right? Um, adding more to it. You know, adding more so that therapy is not just so Eurocentric and that there is a connection to the trauma that many of us have endured, the dehumanization that many of us endured, including our white brothers and sisters, and um, bringing us back emotionally home to our bodies, to our minds, and to our spirits. Yeah. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I'm here for this Ted talk. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, there's so much there, right? There's, there's so many places, obviously you've built a career on it. So clearly it's a slightly big thing. Um, and so, um, uh, there is, uh, there is so much there. I, I had the, the, the privilege of, uh, uh, of living in Minneapolis now, um, and uh, and and was here uh, when George Floyd was murdered, um, and uh, moved here shortly after Philander Castile was murdered, um, and, uh, and a, a town that is hurting. Um, we were uh, my parents came to visit and meet uh, our newborn son, um, and uh, and uh, anytime someone comes here, I'm like, we're going to the George Floyd Memorial, um, right? And we're just over like you just have to see it, you have to be there, you have to feel it, you have to recognize it, name it. Uh, right. And, uh, and it is the, the hurt in this country is unreal. And so hearing you talk about, uh, the depth of where the hurt came from, 
right? All the way back to, to colonization, um, right? And the only Christopher I recognize is Wallace. Um, and uh, <laughs> so uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we got that biggie shirt on, I see you. Um, but, uh, but still, um, uh, going going so far back. So here's, uh, I have a couple of questions. The first one I'll ask is, um, as a queer, indigenous, black person of color, um, Latino, Latinx, uh, whatnot, uh, uh, um, when you, I guess, how, do, how would one name... Oh, what I'm going through is probably an issue of decolon of, of colonization, mm -hmm. right? Like, like where does that point? Like, at what point do we stop blaming ourselves and blaming? It's like, oh, it's just look at the, there's these so many examples of people who pick themselves up by their bootstraps and like they they made it, so why can't I? Um, right, like that kind of shit that you always hear that uh, that the GOP loves to throw in people's faces. And so, um, but um, like. Uh, like at what point do individuals learn there's something bigger here that is worth exploring? There is, uh, it's not just, uh, um, to go back earlier, it's not just this, this idea of here's the answer. It's the healing that has to come. How, you know, how do those individuals learn that, feel that and move towards that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, and I have some pieces, yeah, um, but I think that we're still living it, like I'm pa like li literally embodying it. Um, so that would be my first response: is that it, it's in the body. Um, and and mm -hmm. as an example, let's say um, I'm thinking of a person that I was working with um, for for like four or five years at the university, and. Um, dad alcoholic. Um, I don't want to say the country they're from because it'll be too, you know, yep. make it too obvious and what have you. Um, but it was somewhere, it was, a uh, they're black identified uh, from a Latinx country. Um, and what would start happening is, you know, dad would drink and dad would, um, always say, Oh, I'm getting a heart attack. I'm getting a heart attack and clutches hard and start this and start, start just, creating havoc in the house. So she knew that she had to lock her door and lock her sister and brother in when dad started clutching as hard. And, um, you know, she was drinking a lot. You know, she was drinking a lot. Yeah. And, but it was, it was minimized. It was like, oh, well, I'm partying, I'm in college, da, 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 da. And, you know, and then as a therapist, and this is why I'm focusing on therapists so much with, with this process of bringing us back to our roots and looking at the roots, because right, that's what we talk about. Like, oh, look at the root, it's childhood trauma. But what if shit, what if the trauma began before your childhood, right? Like, mm -hmm. what if the trauma began before your childhood? And it, it's not bonkers because look at all this research we have. Um, and in sessions, you'll see people uh, literally begin to see things that are representative of their families, mm. of their histories, of their li like it literally just starts to come out in the conversation. So as the to go back to the example, um, you know, first I'm thinking this is more just like childhood trauma. That's what's coming up. She was just like, when I'm drinking, I'm finding myself, you know, my heart hurts, and I'm like, do you, do you, you? She's like, no, what, what? I'm like. Your dad clutches his chest. You told me, like, you've been telling me for the last three fucking years, because because we're cool now. I'm just like, yeah, right. dude, you've been telling me for the last three fucking years. And they're like, oh, shit, yes, I have. Oh, shit. So, you know, we're talking about this. And then maybe maybe weeks, maybe days later, um, we begin to talk about, you know, uh, what, what will often happen, I notice as a psychologist, in somebody's process of unpacking, inevitably culture comes up, whether, you know, they're Irish, uh, mm -hmm. Portuguese, Czechoslovakian, you know, like culture comes up in some way, shape or form, or you ain't doing your therapy, right? Or no shade, but you're white identified. So it's assumed that all people feel this way, right? Yep. Again, exactly. and I'm not saying exactly. it as a shady way. I'm just saying white becomes the baseline for everything else, including um, the world events, how we're doing everything. Yeah. So, you know, she's like, you know, I'm doing this report. They want me to talk about where I'm from. I don't feel a connection from where I'm from. My father said, da, 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 and again with the father. So we started threading father, uh, her current behaviors, 
and her relationship to her environment. And as a therapist, you know, I felt it was my duty to ask, well, you know, why did your father and mother come here? What was their experience like? And I have to tell you, James, maybe 10 times out of 10, but let's just say nine times out of 10 for like fuck's sake, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, people start crying, even if they've never even visited a place mm. that they're from or their families are from. Yeah. Like there's usually this like, and for this person, as an example, it was like, I don't know why my chest hurts. I don't know why my chest hurts. Dr. Mullen, yo, I don't know why my chest hurts. Da -da 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 -da. And then, you know, next week she comes in, I was drinking a lot. You know, I don't know why I was thinking of place that is home. I don't want to say the name of it, right? Um, <clears throat> and so what I have been teaching other therapists and I have been noticing is that there's nothing neat, clean, and linear about this because we don't want to put it in a box and pathologize it, right? Like We don't want to give it like, this is how you know that colonization needs to be treated. Check, 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 check. But it's rather the embodiment. It's the felt sense. It's the unpacking. Um, and, and honestly, these days, it's even easier because people are coming in. Back in the past, nobody would come in and say, I'm dealing with racial trauma, Dr. Mullen. Help me, help me. Hell no. But now... People are like, yo, I'm getting discriminated against because I have locks. I'm getting discriminated against because I'm visibly trans identified and I have a five o'clock shadow at three. I'm mm -hmm. getting discriminated against because, you know, so people are coming in and they're having a better understanding of how it isn't them. But then a good therapist should be able to help you realize like, okay, this is the history. This is what needs to be cleared up, right? Or, you know, Santeria, Ifa, in um, you know Yoruba tradition with a lot of African spiritualities. Sometimes we need to give our ancestor something. Sometimes we need to make sure that an ancestor has a has a certain burial, not literally, but we honor them or we light a candle sometimes before session with some people. So these are things that people have been in the closet about, and I think that decolonizing therapy is about the relationship not just between therapist and person, but the person and their ecosystem and the environment. Mm -hmm. And how does white bodied supremacy show up in my body? Right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, as a person of color, like what is it like to walk around down my block when there's eight Trump flags? Mm -hmm. True story. Now there's three, but <laughs> you know, and, and, yeah. And even if it's like, there are nice people that have said hi to me all the time and they're just like, Oh, you're the one that always feeds the cats on the block and how are you doing? You're the doctor and blah, blah, blah. But then these are the people with Trump flags. And I'm like, I don't know how to feel about that. Yeah. Right. Like, 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 like does, does it just mean that you're a Republican and that's cool. That's your business. Does it mean that you think he's a good businessman or does that mean that you're for having me dead? Which like, I don't know. Can we have tea? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, I don't a quick know. Survey I, I, for you. It's a quick survey neighbors. Which one of these are you? Okay. Thank you. Just check it off. <laughs> I know where we are. Yeah. Right. Walk away. But yeah, I mean, you know, basically James, it's it, just this feeling of, um, you know, therapy, you feel it, you know, you feel it. And it starts to arise in a person and there becomes a link to their family. And then there's another link to a place, a land, or it is a symptom um, that just doesn't go away. Even working on it, working on it, working on it, working on it. Sometimes it's like finding another angle. Right? You, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, like I, it just, it's another angle. And it's like, wait, well, can you tell me a little bit about what it was like when um, your grandmother passed away and you went down south? What was that like for you? Sometimes it starts there. I went down to my grandmother's funeral and I was called boy 18 times. Mm -hmm. Like, Dr. Mullen, I was going to fuck somebody up. Like so They called me boy. Like, like that to me is reminiscent of some Emmett Till shit. True, this is true words, right? And And I said... I feel you that that there that's a latent you know especially when you're in the south right like boy can can be a lot so um it is when the history or the pain or the current racial trauma like the murders of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor when they start to um affect our sleep when they start to affect our relationships with other people uh, particularly white people, um, when it starts to affect how we see ourselves, whether we feel safe. So that's another angle of it. It can get historical mm -hmm. or it can also be related to present day or both. 
And then how does this affect my functioning? How does this affect how I see myself? How does this affect um, whether or not I want to live anymore? Yes. You know, um, Mm -hmm. and how can I start to heal some of that? Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Deeply powerful. (laughs) Uh, It really is. Uh, and, and, And it it's illuminating, right? For someone who uh, didn't grow up that way, didn't come up, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I was taught, uh, I le- you know, I learned at 36 years old that George Washington teeth weren't wooden. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's where I was at, right? Like, I, you know, I was taught in schools that, you know, we the, the, the slavery happened and then, uh, and then, and then God bless Abraham Lincoln. And then, you know, eh, well, then we had some weird policies, but then, Hey, thank goodness for Martin Luther King. But, but Malcolm X was bad. He was mad and that was bad. And right. But, but Martin Luther King was great. And like, yeah, now we're all fine. Right. And so, uh, and it's like, Oh, wait, it turns out we're not right. But that's what the history books taught me because my Euro, uh, the Euro centric authors that wrote my books that wanted me to feel like everything was hunky dory in my beautiful town of 98% white people in New York. Um, right. Like, I mean, you can't help what you were learned. You can't help what you learned when you were taught. And, and I think that is important. And that's why we also see, I think a lot of white people are, are mad, right? Because they're being called to the mat and be like, this is what I was taught. Like, what do you want me to do? Um, right. And, uh, but, uh, to assume that everything you taught was true and that everything that you were taught is, is everything, um, that is, that's woefully ignorant. Um, yeah. and so, a lot of these conversations that are happening that are that are finally getting the volume that they have deserved because the conversation done been happening right there's just more people because of the pandemic whose patterns were broken that their ears were shifted and so there's a, a eerie timing to it all um and uh so now they're finally joining the conversation that has been happening um a lot of what i'm uh, what I've been doing and trying to talk to other individuals is, is there's a rule in improv, uh, an improv comedy where if that's true, then what else is true? Mm-hmm. You kind of play a fun game, right? It's the way that you kind of create fun spaces. It's like, all right, we're all in an aquarium. Okay. If that's true, what else is true? All right, cool. Then like this is over here or that's there. If we're, if we're throwing a party in an aquarium, then you know, what kind of, what do the Cheetos look like? Right. You start to create a world and, a lot of people, when they face discomfort, don't want to admit, okay, if that is true, then what else is true? Which yes. is why, in my opinion, like the Black Lives Matter movement, it's like, well, why do their lives matter, right? But yeah. what if what if that was true? Then what else is true, right? Like, yes. what if what individuals who are being systemically oppressed for centuries, right, Um what if that is their lived experience? Yes. If that is true, what else is true? But yes. most people can't get there. And it has taken me a long time to get there, um, right? Like, I'm, I didn't win any awards out here, right? You don't win the award for the most woke. It just makes you the biggest douchebag. Mm-hmm. Um, and so <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing is, uh, is the work that you're doing uh, – it is for everybody, uh, even though it's not necessarily maybe consistently targeted, right? When I when I follow the Instagram posts and I read things, or I'm like, oh god, what the hell am I supposed to do with this information here? <laughs> what the truth in here? It's rock I'm supposed to crawl under for being a piece of shit, all right? Yeah. Like, and 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 that's not the intent of it. Um, the work that you're doing is beautiful. The Thank fact you. that you have stepped into the courage. Uh, stepped into courage of being like, this is worth my time uh, that I will go on my own uh, and I will feel alone because I'm feeling alone while standing on top of what matters mountain. Um, <laughs> right. Like, it, it, <laughs> like what a place to be alone. Right. Like, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. so uh, I, I, you have other things to do today. Uh, and I am so <laughs> deeply grateful. For the time me. As far as I'm mm-hmm. concerned, I'm going to say that I'm going to make you say this on air. Cause this way I can hold you to it. I think this is part one of our conversation. Um, and I would love to have a part two because there's so much that I want to talk to you about and will talk to you about uh, just as far as like, I just had a baby boy, right? And both of my, my wife and I are incredibly white. Um, don't let the swag fool you. Um, but, uh, but, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it's like, 
when when does the teaching start? How yeah. does it start? What does it look like? I was taught, I was I learned that I was white when I was 19 during RA training. Mm. Uh, right? That's mm. too late. My nephew learned at the age of 13 watching mm. George Floyd be murdered. That's mm. great. Those six years matter. Um, right. Um, and so uh so I'm excited to have more conversations with you in the future. But in the meantime, Dr. Jennifer Mullen, uh, <laughs> thank you for teaching me from afar, one post at a time. Uh, it has truly been enlightening, important, and humbling. Uh, and I cannot thank you enough for, for coming into the diner with me and hanging out. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being a friend. Cute Golden Girls. <laughs> and uh, yeah, congrats, man. I'm just Congrats for all the things that are coming to, that are here, that are right there at the precipice. And I would love to have a part two. Thank you for everybody listening. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in more work, just, you know, dive in. You know, that's what I would say, not just to my work, but anywhere that you can start to get in, anywhere you can start to get a little bit uncomfortable, um, go there. You know, go there and start getting curious. It shouldn't make you feel like shit all the time. Nothing should make you feel like shit all the time, but it should elicit a oh fuck moment mm -hmm. <laughs> and um and i think that you know that's the beauty when we learn we can then pass it and pay it forward so um thank you to everyone thank you to you james i appreciate you so very much and go back to that baby right now let's go Got let's go <laughs> Y'all, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Diner Talks with James. Make sure you follow Decolonizing Therapy uh, on Instagram. Uh, they're blowing the hell up, deservedly so. Also, Dr. Jennifer Mullen is the website if you want to learn more about the work that she is doing in the groups and the psychology, uh, the counseling, I should say, and and, and the psychology that she uh, the, the practice. And so, um, Dr. Mullen, a.k.a. Jen, uh, thank you so much for coming through. And everybody on the podcast, thank you so much for listening. Hope you all have a good day. And until next time we catch up, my friends, uh, keep punching small talk in the face by asking better questions. You all yeah.